Welcome to the Power of Your Mind podcast. I'm Victoria Gallagher, your host. Have you been attempting to use law of attraction or hypnosis to attract financial abundance, a soulmate, or career success? Would you like to be happy, motivated, and successful, have better health, enjoy more fulfilling relationships? overcome struggle and gain mastery over your life, then join me on this amazing self-help podcast where you'll unleash the power of your mind. I'll be sharing 20 years of wisdom and techniques of hypnotherapy, law of attraction, visualization, meditation, personal growth, positive affirmations, and other effective methods to help you tap into the great power which resides in your mind and become the best version of yourself. Well, hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Power of Your Mind podcast. You're listening to episode number 105. I'm Victoria Gallagher, Law of Attraction hypnotist and number one bestselling author of Practical Law of Attraction, Align Yourself with the Manifesting Conditions and Successfully Attract Your Desires. I'm also the founder of HipTalk.com and HypnoCloud apps, which gives you access to over 500 hypnosis recordings right in the palm of your hand. So be sure to download that app from the iTunes or Google Play app stores. Today, I am bringing back a special guest with me to the show, Tom Bunn. Tom Bunn is a licensed therapist and retired airline captain. He has worked for Fearful Flyers for over 35 years and in that time developed an effective way to keep his clients from having a panic attack on the plane. Studies have shown that over 80% of his clients became completely free of panic when flying. And as a side effect, they became free of panic on the ground as well. This was important because the therapy most often used from panic, CBT, ends panic in only 16% of clients treated with it. So that led Tom to write Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. This book focused on ending panic in elevators and bridges, tunnels, high places, and MRIs. And recently, he supplemented that book with a workbook aimed specifically at pandemic-related issues. And he can be found on the websites panicfree.net, fearofflying.com, and also on his YouTube channel and his blog um, off of uh, Psychology Today. Uh, So today, Tom is, and you can find out more about that in the show notes. Uh, Today, Tom is going to be sharing some of his insights on how to be calm during panic-related fear, anxiety, and claustrophobia. So welcome back to the show, Tom. Thank you, Victoria. So these are some, the last time we talked, uh, you know, we weren't dealing with this uh, this pandemic. (laughs) Yeah. And people were already dealing with lots of anxiety over relative, you know, all kinds of things, like you said, from elevators, bridges, uh, flying. And now we have this whole new thing that's bringing all kinds of fear into uh, into people's hearts and minds. And so, um, yeah, so welcome it's, back to the show it's, now. It's the fact that we can't control this pandemic and we can't run from it has made it very hard because you see you could this hell of a simplification what if we can divide people into two categories people who have an accelerator pedal and a brake pedal Mm -hmm. and people who just have an accelerator pedal Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we have one system that revs us up the sympathetic nervous system We have Mm -hmm. a system that calms us down, the parasympathetic nervous system. So all of Mm -hmm. us have it. The problem is that about 40% of us don't have the mental software built in to actuate the brake pedal. That's interesting. So the way that we try to keep from getting too upset is to try to control things. 
to keep yeah. things from happening that bother us. And if we lose control, then we want to escape. So, I mean, just think of something as simple as an elevator or a bridge or a tunnel or an MRI. The main problem is you can't escape. If you start yeah. to have feelings that are uncomfortable, you say, oh, I don't have any way to control them because I can't get out of here. And when you start having enough stressful feelings, you begin to lose track mentally without knowing it. You lose track mm-hmm. without knowing it about mm-hmm. what's real and what's imaginary. Mm-hmm. So one of the most important things in this whole issue of how to regulate feelings is something a British um, psychological theorist, Peter Fonagy, calls psychic equivalence. Psyche okay. meaning the mind and equivalent uh-huh. meaning the same as. Okay. So he says that for the first three years of life, a child thinks everything in their mind is real. And they actually, he says, they actually think everything that's real is in their mind. They see no mm-hmm. difference between their what they're aware of and what reality is. Right. But at around three, he says, the light goes on and the child says, oh, my goodness, there's something in my mind that doesn't exist. And there's something out there that's not in my mind sometimes. So the child figures it out that he can pretend. Mm-hmm. Now, this ability to know whether you're perceiving or imagining or remembering, this ability is, is something we, we can do because we look inward at the same time we're doing whatever we're doing. We're kind of in the background noticing whether we're perceiving or remembering or imagining. And so we know that if we're imagining something, it's not real until we get stressed. Right. But when we get stressed, we stop doing that inward looking. Only we don't know we stop doing it because you have to have the inward looking to know that you're not looking inward. Right. So when you stop, when it slides away from you, whatever you're imagining becomes your reality, even though it's imagination. That makes so much sense. You know, as a hypnotist, I always talk about the, you know, the subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and, and what you're imagining. Um, but you, the way you explained it, I mean, it's, it's in a way it's like when, when we are, are in a stressful situation, you know, all of our reasoning and logic ultimately is kind of going out the window. So we're not really using our conscious mind to, to, you know, to think straight, to, to be able to make the determination between what's real and, and imagined. And generally emotions are controlled in the unconscious part of the brain. Exactly. You know, it's interesting because, I mean, we have this, it's our imagination really just getting away, uh, you know, just, just getting, getting, we're getting, um, just allowing our imagination to take over. And we have, some people have a very overactive imagination sometimes. <laughs> well, that's what I hear from clients. They say, I have a very vivid imagination. It, I, I would fine tune it to say, everybody's, can have a vivid imagination, mm-hmm. but when you get stressed, it's vivid enough that it becomes reality. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you don't to know the that point, it yeah, to the point where, um, you know, you can be almost having, you know, panic attack or um, anxiety or stress or having physical reactions to something that hasn't happened. Well, exactly. Look, for example, suppose you get some stress hormones, who knows from what, it wouldn't matter. You just get some stress hormones and, and you notice, gee, my heart's pounding. Mm-hmm. Well, you might have the thought, I wonder if there's something wrong with my heart. Mm-hmm. Now that's just a thought. You could say, eh, well, okay. But what if you get stressed enough that that imagination or that consideration that you might be having a heart attack, what if you take it seriously and get a oh, little yeah. bit more stress hormones? Yeah. And if you get enough stress hormones, instead of saying, I wonder if this is a heart attack, it becomes, I'm having a heart attack. Yeah. And then you go (laughs) to maybe get checked out and they give you an EKG and they find that your heart's okay. They say, well, you must have had a panic attack. Because 
when you have enough stress, whether it's something in your body that you think is, is, a, is an illness, mm -hmm. um, and you can't control it, and you can't run from it. You see, once again, if you go back to that idea that if a person has the good mental software to operate their calming system, yeah. they can stay calm enough that they can continue to notice that the thought they're having is just a thought. But when they don't have that calming automatically working for them, very easily slide into too much stress to tell the difference between what's imaginary and what's real. So what I <laughs> stumbled on is that if you can keep that calming system working for you automatically, you can protect your ability to tell what's real and what isn't. That's great. That's great to know. So, so you started this, uh, this workbook recently. Um, and so what, you know, what was it that made you decide to go ahead and write this workbook? Well, every Wednesday night we have uh, an hour of free counseling on Zoom. Mm. And um, one of the people on, it was about a month ago, um, is in Tucson. Um, her husband's a doctor, so she uh -huh. has had some concerns about him being in the hospital and getting infected. Um, but she's gone through the fear of flying course and mm -hmm. read some of the books. And she said to her amazement, she's doing okay in this epidemic. And she said, I think the stuff that you told us has become built in. And she used to work in publishing. She said, you should get out an ebook." And so I thought, Oh, okay. I'll do that in a week or two. We were, I was just kidding about it, yeah. but I started working on it and I pulled some of the things that I had written from the newsletter and from psychology today and was able to get an ebook together in about three weeks and put it out. She was saying that the things that she had learned had made this experience of the pandemic pretty comfortable for her because of what had become completely built in. And that's, what we'd like to do is to completely build in that mental software that about 40% of us didn't get when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, are there any exercises in there that maybe, um, you know, somebody listening to this show sure. could easily yeah. benefit from? Yeah. Uh, Stephen Porges, um, is a neurological researcher. He's really well known. He's done has lots of awards. And so he, it's, it's interesting that some of the most important things in psychology are stumbled on. And he stumbled mm -hmm. on this when he was in grad school. He was studying the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. When the vagus nerve is activated, our heart rate goes down, our breathing rate goes down, we relax. And when we breathe in, there's a new supply of oxygen in the lungs that needs to be transported. Mm -hmm. So the vagus nerve is not activated when you, when you breathe in so that the heart can do its job. But after three or four seconds, you've transported that new oxygen. And so you breathe out. Now the heart says kind of like, well, let me take a little break here and slow down, maybe 20 beats per minute until okay. you breathe in again. So he thought studying the vagus nerve was going to be interesting because he said, yeah, maybe it has something to do with what's happening with sudden infant death syndrome. Maybe the vagus nerve is premies is not mature enough. So he started hooking up people to his equipment. And what he was surprised to find with the people he was studying is that when a friend walked by, their heart rate went down. Mm -hmm. So he started looking into that as well. And he has developed what he calls a social engagement system. What he finally comes into is that when we see a stranger, we get stress hormones. The amygdala mm -hmm. fires off anytime we see something that's not familiar to us or something unexpected have us, happens. So when we see a stranger, we get stress hormones. Yeah. And if it were not for the social engagement system where we pick up unconsciously, as we were talking about, the signals from another person's face, their voice quality, and their body language, we probably would get the heck out of there. Yeah. Because we'd, we'd feel like running away. But 
although we're getting stress hormones that, that are revving us up, our social engagement system, the signals we're picking up from this person are saying, oh, the person looks okay. Yeah. Now that would give us enough calming to not run away, but we still may not be totally comfortable. But if we could start having a conversation and start hanging out and get to know the person, if they are completely non-judgmental, someone we feel not only physically safe with, but also emotionally safe with, the vagus nerve is completely activated and the heart rate goes down about 20 beats per minute. And the, I don't know, have you had that feeling sometimes with a person where you feel your guard let down? Oh, that's, yeah. when the vagus, that's when the vagus nerve is fully stimulated. So yeah. now to get back to the question, <laughs> what can we do for somebody who's watching this? Well, I was having that, that experience actually all day yesterday, you know, because, um, you know, now not only are we dealing with this uh, pandemic, but then, you know, just recently, of course, we've had, um, you know, a lot of the, the writing, you know, and, and looting and, and things like that. And so with my <laughs> overactive imagination, you know, I was just out taking a walk in a very, I mean, I live in a very safe community, a very safe neighborhood, but you know, it's like my guard's up a little bit. Sure. My guard yeah. is up and, mm-hmm. and I'm, a, I'm on the lookout. I, I'm, and I'm a little bit overly on the lookout. So it's like every single car <laughs> that I see, it, you know, it's like, it, it's kind of elevating my, my heart rate just a little bit. And I, I was very in touch with that. I was very much in tune with the fact that, yeah, you know, just even. But you probably had to be by yourself. You know, yeah, I was by myself. But if you had. If it had been six months ago and you were shopping with a friend, yeah. your friend's face, your friend's voice quality, and your friend's body language would unconscious. Com- you see, you don't know this happening. Completely unconsciously calming you. Right. Well, and just you know, um, we have we have a we live in a very friendly neighborhood, so um, most of the people. Um, you know, when I, cause I was like really looking into the cars, you know, they would wave. And so as soon yeah. as they'd wave, it was like that friendly, calming face. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. they're good. <laughs> well, so, so take us, let's take, go back to this question. What can we do for somebody who's watching? Now yeah. the principle here is another person's face, voice quality, what they say may be of some significance, but that's cognitive. What matters is what's unconscious. So mm-hmm. unconsciously picking up the quality of their voice has a common effect hits the break mm-hmm. button. And then <clears throat> their body language or touch, face, voice, and touch are the three things that activate the calming system, the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm-hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> what we need to do is to not depend just on being able to be in control or able to escape because that's gotten to be more limited with the pandemic. Mm-hmm. What we need to do is to get the braking system working. And now we need to get the software set up. So if we got this face, voice, and touch that will calm us, well, that's what we got to look for. So right. I invite our people watching this to scan through their the people they know or have known and look for someone they feel really comfortable with. It needs to be someone who's both physically safe to be with and psychologically safe to be with. Oftentimes people say, well, I'm going to choose my mate. And I say, well, look, I'm married too. And I know that we're not always that way with each other. It, right. But let me throw something interesting in here, right along this line. With fearful flyers, one thing I found long ago was that if they linked getting engaged to being on the airplane, it calmed them. If they linked wedding vows to getting on the airplane, that calmed them. Because that's the point in the relationship when you're totally accepted. You know, mm-hmm. Six six months later, well, it could be a little different. We start right. finding <laughs> things that we don't want to totally accept. Right. So I say, well, you know, you, maybe you could use your your spouse, but yeah, probably if you link that be, argument we got into last <laughs> weekend, <laughs> that's probably not going to make you feel too calm. So yeah, so if you yes. go back to those points. It's, Look for a person who's, uh, I don't know if you, you know that movie, The Big Lebowski, the guy who's so laid back, you know, that's an example. But anybody who's just kind of a non-judgmental kind of person, it's easy to overlook the right person because we're more impressed with people who are judgmental. Mm-hmm. So just think about some easygoing person and imagine that you're with them 
notice their face in your memory, the voice quality, and their body language or touch. Now, now you've got a source of common. That person's face, voice, and touch will activate your parasympathetic nervous system. Now comes the question about what do you need to set up so that it works automatically? Mm. And there's a couple of possibilities. If you know a situation like an MRI or a bridge or tongue or elevator, if you know a situation that tends to trigger you, you can get a piece of paper and write down, let's say an elevator experience into it, maybe 15 steps, such as thinking about going to a building, walking into it, seeing the elevator, walking over to the elevator, pressing the button, waiting for it, door opens, step in, and so on throughout the whole elevator trip. You want to link up every element of an elevator trip to that person's face. Mm -hmm. So you imagine you have a photograph, let's say the first step, thinking about going to the building. So your friend is, you're imaginarily holding a photograph of someone thinking about going to the building by their face. So that you see their face and the safety signals coming from their face and the photograph or cartoon, if you want to use a cartoon, of the elevator plan, going mm -hmm. to the elevator. And then you imagine the two of you look at it, the photograph or cartoon together and talk about it. And mm -hmm. then as you're talking about it, you get a hug. There's your face, voice, and touch. So you go through all, ever how many steps you've broken it down into, one step by step by step, face, voice, and touch. You set that link up so that you remember Pavlov's dogs? He fed the dogs, rang a mm -hmm. bell. After he did that a few times, he could just ring yeah. the bell and the dogs would salivate. So, so it's anchoring. Once you, yeah, once we've done that with um, um, connecting the elevator experience all the elements of it, step by step by step of it, to your friend's face, voice, and touch. When you're actually doing the elevator, your friend is there taking care of you unconsciously. If you find value in this personal growth related material, I strongly recommend that you sign up for your $1 trial to my personal growth club. Just head on over to personalgrowthclub.com and get a whole month of premium personal growth club video training materials, meditations. You also get six free hypnosis sessions that are valued at over $174, all for this trial of just $1. Even if you cancel, you can keep the six hypnosis sessions. That's my gift to you. And that's how confident I am that you are going to love Personal Growth Club. Go to personalgrowthclub.com and start your $1 one month trial today. That's cool. No. So it's so, like fixing that part of your subconscious mind that was link, linking that to, uh, you know, turning on the, uh, the, you know, the anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. And now yeah. it's fixed it. It's because well, it's, you, you know, you, those feelings are coming from the sub, subconscious mind. So now yeah, you, you know, you're still going to get the stress. This is the mm -hmm. question. Of just counteract the stress, mm -hmm. which was what, Porges, he, he said this is so powerful that the parasympathetic nervous system can stimulate the vagus nerve enough to counteract the stress hormones. Mm -hmm. He called it the vagal break. He said it's like being in a car, automatic transmission. If you put your foot solidly on the brake, you can pump on the gas. Car's not going to go anywhere. The brake will override it. So all we need to do is to get the ability to hit the brake pedal, and we can take care of anxiety. So use your friend, link it to the things that cause anxiety. But then, <clears throat> so that's the first thing, to the things that cause anxiety. But also link it to arousal itself. Mm -hmm. Many of us who have had some traumatic experiences have linked the feeling of arousal with the feeling of danger. Mm -hmm. And the feeling of danger with fear, fear, danger, arousal, it's all the same thing. So as soon as we feel tense, we feel like something awful is about to happen. <clears throat> what we need to do is to take arousal and let arousal just be arousal. Mm -hmm. Because you probably have told your clients this, that arousal that's 
positive you think of as, as, as excitement. The yeah. same physiological stuff that's excitement is the same physiological stuff that you can think of as danger. Right. It's, it's Ex- the yeah. The excitement and, and, you know, the fearful anxiety, they, I mean, it's really the, f- the same feeling. It's mm-hmm. really the same feeling in the body. It's just about what are we thinking about? Yeah. What's the what's, story what's we're making up about thinking? that? Is yeah. your automatic thinking, if you're in a certain environment, going to take you to feeling like this is danger? So what we can do is link face, voice, and touch, the calming things, to the feeling of getting aroused. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you could say, okay, one of the elements of arousal is uh, increased heart rate. And for the fear of flying, when we wanted to attack panic, <laughs> attack panic attacks, I broke down the panic attack into five main parts, pounding heart, rapid breathing, tension in the body, sweatiness, some psychological changes. And because now I wanted to link calming experience to those things one by one. Um, so that if the panic attack started, it would stop. Um, I figured we'd better use cartoons. Mm-hmm. Because if we use cartoons rather than put you in that situation where you're feeling it, you're less likely to get triggered. You know, We're used to seeing cartoon characters get in trouble and get out of it. They always do. So I set up a set of cartoons. And so I'll run you kind of through it. Clark Kent gets on an airplane. Now, he's the guy who can become Superman. And he's yep. got on his business suit and his glasses looking like a nerd sitting there thinking, well, if anything goes wrong with the plane, no problem. I'll just put on Superman and grab it and put it on the ground. But as the plane takes off, he says, oh, no, someone's got kryptonite on this plane. I can't become Superman. So he starts to have a panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, let's just take one element of the panic attack and um, pounding heart. That's an easy thing to do with Clark Kent because he wears this business suit, blue business suit. And when when a cartoonist wants to show pounding heart, he draws big red exclamation marks on the chest. You've probably seen that. So you can imagine Clark Kent on the airplane starting to panic and he's feeling pounding heart. So he's got these big red exclamation marks on his chest and alongside his chest, some slightly curved lines. So there's your cartoon. Okay. Now you want to link that pounding heart cartoon to your friend's face. So your friend has the cartoon by the face of Superman having a panic attack. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at least he gets to be super sometimes. We don't ever get to be super. So he's <laughs> right. having a panic attack because he can't be. And so the next thing is you want to link it to your friend's voice. So you're talking with him for Superman's particular. And then you get a hug about it. So that links pounding heart to mm-hmm. uh, face, voice, and touch. So that see what's going to happen next is that when you next time think about maybe I'm having a heart attack, your friend's face, voice, and touch is going to keep you remembering that this is just a thought. Right. So it's just, it's going to call that up instantaneously when you Mm -hmm. link, when you link these up. Yeah. And then for uh, difficulty breathing, Maybe you should explain what happens is that when you get some stress hormones, it's getting you into the fight or flight response, trying to get you ready to want to fight. So you get some stress hormones, your breathing goes faster, your heart rate goes faster. You get some more stress hormones and you breathe even faster. You get more stress hormones. Sooner or later, you get to the point that you really can't breathe any faster. Mm -hmm. And so you begin to think, well, you could think, I'm suffocating. Um, And some people actually do when they feel like they can't get enough air, start to panic. So what I use here is a cartoon that is an old cartoon character, Popeye on an airplane, because I was doing this stuff mainly with airplanes to start with, but you could, doesn't matter. Just want to take Popeye. But in this case, let's say he's with his girlfriend, Olive, and he's starting to feel uncomfortable. And so he figures it's time for a can of spinach. So I reached into his pocket, can't find a spinach. Oh, now it's an emergency. So he starts to panic and he feels like he can't breathe. So he, he's blown his cover. He's a macho guy. He wouldn't want Olive to know that he's having a panic attack. But now he's, what can he do? He's got to turn to Olive for help. So he says, or well, he would like to say, hey, Olive, I can't breathe. But the way it comes out, because he's starting to squeeze his neck to show her that he's having trouble breathing. Oh, I, I, oh, I can't breathe. So there's your breathing cartoon. You want to link that up to your friend's face, voice, and touch. 
and the cartoon character who's famous for panic attacks, SpongeBob gets all sweaty. So mm. <laughs> with the sweat rolling down his face, link that up. Uh, psychological changes. Some people feel like things aren't real. Some people feel like um, out of body, mm -hmm. looking at themselves from outside when stressed. So the only cartoon character that I know that gets psychological changes is Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo, so yeah. <laughs> yes, he just, he's on an airplane in the belly of the plane in a, in a kennel. And as the plane takes off, he's hearing things and feeling things that he's never heard or felt before. So he gets overwhelmed. And he could either think in terms of derealization that his kennel has become like a plexiglass box and he feels like reality is, can't get connected with it because he's isolated in this box. Or if it's out of body experience, he could have another version of himself looking at him in the kennel. Mm. Anyway, link that up. Yeah. And then the last one is easy. You know, the cartoon character that's famous for tension, the Incredible Hulk. Bruce Banner's the normal person. Yeah. So Bruce Banner <laughs> gets on a plane, everything's okay, but something then goes wrong. I don't know why, but he starts to turn into the Hulk, starts to turn green, pop his buttons off and all that. Body thinking, <laughs> so you can link that up. So face, voice, touch, linking it up to those five things that or the main things that you feel in panic. So depending so, on mm -hmm. how you are experiencing the anxiety that those are the characters. And do you, do you have those characters? Like, do you have those, uh, uh, those scripts basically in your book or uh, actually, yeah, they're in the fear of flying book. Um, they're in the panic book, they, but you can <clears throat> you just, you can also find them online. Mm -hmm. If you go to fear of flying.com slash photos, uh -huh. fear of flying dot com slash photos you can see the photographs that we use for linking to flight and to panic wow okay. okay that's yeah that's that's i mean this is really helpful really helpful now, the the additional way to build in some software that calms us down automatically is 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 this for the next few days every time you notice that you have gotten a little stress See if you can pick it up right away and stop and just imagine your best friend or the, who this person is that, that you're using for comedy. Imagine the person just walks in the room, says hello to you, comes over and gives you a hug. Mm. So do you see what you've got there, face, voice, and touch? You, you respond to feeling revved up by immediately activating a calming system. Yeah. And it'll become a habit. It'll become automatic. So for the next few days, every time you feel revved up, Imagine your friend walks in, there's their face, says hello to you, however they would do that. There's the voice quality and comes over and gives you a hug. There's the touch. The three things that Borges found activate the comic system. Yeah, so it's so simple and it, it doesn't take much time at all. Exactly, you, it, yeah. you just really have to um, just remember to do it. Well, you have to practice it. You want to build it in so that it yeah. works, so you don't have to do it. Um, with the airplane, for example, people on their first flight after they learned this stuff, they say, this is cool. This is too simple. And they, they worry about it, but they get on the plane and they wait for the panic, panic to hit. And they just keep waiting and keep waiting and keep waiting. It never happens. They said, it's just weird that they just are not having these feelings. That, but as you know, as a hypnotist, that when you get stuff built into the unconscious mind, it takes care of things that person cannot control consciously. Well, you're, uh, you're, you're, you are your own mental software developer. <laughs> <laughs> or you are working with a person. Yeah. 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 So that's great. That's great. So, you know, like what, you know, what is it that, uh, you know, makes some people just more natural, you know, more naturally inclined to, to have this mental software? Cause some people don't have to do this, right? Uh, uh, yeah. there's, most yeah. people don't. Um, but, you know, the people that do have to work at this, what is it about them that, you know, that, that makes them not already have this naturally in place? Well, I, I, let me tell you how I think it gets naturally in place. And then I think it's obvious why it does it. <clears throat> when a child is born, their sympathetic nervous system, the one that revs, revs them up, that one's working. You know, any, any kid can scream bloody murder when they're born. 
-hmm. but they have no ability to activate the cognitive system. So what happens? Caregiver, usually mom, calms the baby intuitively, presenting her face, mm -hmm. loving, caring face. Not the way that your husband looked at you when you were fighting the other day. <laughs> <laughs> right. they're, they're totally accepting all your wonderful things. Okay, okay. So that's the the, the child's calming system response to that. So that's the and, parent that is instill installing that software ultimately. Ultimately, but it, it, let's say that then the next thing is the the mom talks to the baby. Baby doesn't understand the words, but still the quality of the voice. And then of course touch is so important. And this is going to go on for months at some place they think I thought maybe it's around a year and a half, but I saw something the other day that they think it may happen earlier than that is that the child becomes able to say, when I get upset, things start happening. Mom comes mm -hmm. and she talks to me and picks me up and fixes everything. So if it happens that mom takes care of, responds and takes care of the child when the child expresses need for it enough, consistently enough, the child then kind of takes it for granted and begins to think, oh, I'm upset. In a moment, she's going to be here mm -hmm. and I'm going to hear her voice and she's going to hug me. So but let's say mom is not there yet, but the mm -hmm. child's now expecting it and the imagination of the mom showing up calms the child. So mm -hmm. now the child is building that software program. Yeah. But now the question is. So it's the expectation that you, you, you build in this expectation that the, the positive experience is going to happen. And yeah. that expectation in and of itself calms you down. The expectation as you have it in your mind calms you down. But then the next question is, does mom actually show up and reinforce it? Right. So mom comes in and surprisingly sees that you're calm. And she says, gee, you know, just a minute ago, you were screaming your head off and now I'm here and you're, ah, but here, let me give you a hug anyway. I'd love to give you a hug. So yeah. it's reinforced. But what if mom mm -hmm. says, I rush in here. I thought you were dying and you're absolutely fine. I was busy. Come on, stop it. So she walks out and doesn't reinforce it. Sounds perfectly logical, but she could say, don't do that. But that's all it would take to not really um, reinforced. There was some research done uh, about a year ago. I don't remember where. And they said that it, it looks like if a child is responded to 51% of the time that they're upset, completely calm. And this research specified chest to chest contact. Mm -hmm. Absolutely calm, 51% of the time the child becomes just securely attached. Attached. Yeah. Securely mm -hmm. attached. So that, mm -hmm. so with, secure attachment means pretty much that, Hey, if I get upset, somebody calls me. Right. Right. The research had this one thing that, that kind of shocking. They said, if the parent frightens the child one time, all bets are off. The child will not be securely attached. If the child is frightened one time. Wow. wow. Even one because. time and you can't ever That's, fix that? That was, what, that was what the research seemed to be saying. They said, if the, they used some specific examples. Of, they said if, if, the, if the parent lunges at the child or yeah. growls at the child. <laughs> I don't know about growling. I don't know where that comes from. But right. that's one of the things they said that they had, some parents had done that had frightened the child. And that that at that point, it seems to me that if you have enough counteracting that, that maybe it will work, but they claim that all it takes is one time to blow the things out of the water. Oh, wow. So that, that child from that point on will ultimately experience the... Uh, say, well, I'm not sure that I can yeah. really depend. So mm -hmm. if, you, if the research shows that about 60% of us have secure attachment and about 40% of us don't. Mm -hmm. And so the secure attachment is connected with this software that operates the parasympathetic nervous system automatically when we need it. And so a person who has that just is easier going enough that they don't have to control everything. They don't know they've got that software because it's working automatically. But then a person who doesn't have it, 
doesn't even know the software exists. They just know that they have to control everything or have to have right. a way to escape. Hello, this is Victoria Gallagher. I hope you're enjoying listening to the Power of Your Mind podcast. As a way of thanking you for listening, I'd like to offer you a one-time discount of 35% off your first order at hiptalk.com. Just go to hiptalk.com and enter the code podcast in the discount code area in your cart and you'll receive 35% off your first order. Thank you so much for listening to the Power of Your Mind podcast. And so if we didn't get that mental, you know, software during our formative years, these exercises are ultimately yeah. the, the way that we. It, it will, it will do the job pretty well, because as I was saying, over 80% of the people who go through the, we have three levels of courses, but if they go through the, the level of course where they get two hours of counseling, they, about 83% become panic free on the plane and all of them get better. It's just that 17% don't get totally panic free on the airplane. The the thing was that it it turned out that although we had never tried to do anything to stop panic on the ground, they were also getting panic free on the ground. So that's why I figured, okay, let's do a book specifically aimed at things that happen on the ground, such as MRIs and bridges and tunnels and so on. That's and great. Then, uh, on that chat we had a month ago, then the person said, hey, this stuff has gotten built in. And she said that I never had a calming system in my whole life until I started doing this. And now I've gotten th- through this pandemic stuff pretty well. That's so amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, everyone, everyone needs to, uh, that's dealing with this needs to go and get your book. So how can, how can they get it? Well, Amazon is where I self published it. So panic free pandemic workbook. Uh, that's the exercise that, that, that are specifically for the pandemic. It's probably good to get the main book panic free, mm-hmm. well. but mm-hmm. certainly the two together. And it's important, I think, because, you know, it's six times more effective than doing six or eight sessions of CBT. So wow. It's just that, you see, the thing with CBT, it's all about conscious control. Yeah. It's about saying, look, this thought that's causing you to panic is irrational. Just mm-hmm. be rational. You That's, can't, <laughs> but you're not rational when you're not rational. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're not rational because your parasympathetic nervous system is not letting you be. So that's, we need something that's going to kick in the parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah. And so, it, and it's these mental kind of mental rehearsals that you do um, sort of more on a proactive. Yeah. A lot of people, you see, I answer questions online sometimes on the core. People say, how can I stop a panic attack? And there's all this advice about breathing exercises. By the time you have a panic attack, that's too late. You're gone. You're along for the ride. What yeah. you need to do is after you had a panic attack and want to know how to stop the next one, train your mind to do it for you. As you said, software, building yeah. the, your own software developer or build it in using the, the steps that we have given you, you, do those and you will install that software. Right. So we're, it's a prevent, it's, it's really more of a preventative measure so that this doesn't happen again. And then you don't have to worry about, well, how do I stop this? Because it, it's already, you know, you've already installed the software that stops it. Yeah. It's bringing to mind that, you know, as I said, we do this chat every, every Wednesday night and it's Mm -hmm. free. People can join it. Time they want to. If you go to fearflying.com and look under talk and read, you can see the information about the chat. It's Zoom. Um, wow, that's wonderful. So, yeah. so it's a free group uh, mm-hmm. every Wednesday night, and every you do Wednesday that on night. Zoom. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You do that on Zoom, um, and-, and so the other night, uh, Jane, who's the person who said I should do the book, she was she was talking about a friend that she's hanging out with on Zoom, who's kind of compulsive and so she just hangs out with her and just being together with her her friend has gotten better uh, just through that contact with her 
being completely That's accepted. wonderful. That's um, wonderful. And what time on uh, Wednesday nights do you do that? Uh, between 10 and 11 Eastern time. Okay. So it's about an hour. Yeah. About yeah. an hour. And um, that's wonderful. And what, uh, you know, so do you work with people on these techniques that we went over? Yeah. Yeah. We seem to go over them every time. Um, one of the, one of the people the other night was saying that, um, Oh, Jane, she was saying that during this COVID crisis, when she was talking to this person who's compulsive about the COVID things, uh, she's saying you have to get good information. You have to trust the people that you're getting your information from and, and be able to then apply it. And one of the other people on the chat said, well, what I have learned from you with the fear of flying stuff is that you can have all the good information that is available. If you aren't calm enough, you can't use it. Mm, yeah, that's so, so true. This goes back again to cognitive is great information, but in order to use that great information, you need to have something that's going to keep you calm enough so that you can apply it. Mm -hmm. That was the thing I found with fearful flyers. There were a few people I worked with who could, that cognitive was what I first tried with panic back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. And there were a few people who could use it, but most of the people who were having panic attacks panicked so quickly they were just gone and couldn't say, oh, let me use this tool that's going to help me slide out of the panic attack. Right. Well, I mean, the point here to me is that, you know, the subconscious is just the, mm. the conscious is no is is no competition for the subconscious mind. The subconscious is going to. Yeah. Yeah, is the subconscious going to do whatever it wants? You know, you're not going to be able to rule over your your subconscious mind um, and just you know, okay, be calm. <laughs> you know, when it's not calm, I mean, the subconscious mind is going to do what it wants, and it's extremely powerful. So we have to, you know, using these techniques and these skills, you know, we've got to reprogram it so that it doesn't behave like that when you're in the middle of uh, a crisis and stress. You know, what I would like people who are watching this to be able to do by using these exercises is build in automatic down regulation so that as soon mm -hmm. as you feel a moment of alarm, these links that you've established bring to mind unconsciously, face, voice, and touch, activates the calming system. And so alarm quickly downregulates to interest. See, from a pilot's point of view, the first thing, the most serious thing that happens from a pilot's point of view is having an engine fire on takeoff, mm -hmm. right in the middle of your takeoff. What happens is that a red light comes on and a bell rings, and the bell is really loud. You can't, so you can't mistake it. The first thing you do is push a button to silence the bell. Mm -hmm. so that you can work with the other pilot to deal with the emergency. Right. What we need as humans is when our bell goes off, the amygdala says, hey, something's going on here. It could be danger. It could be a false alarm, but it could be danger. So what are you going to do about it? Well, you need to get the amygdala to stop bothering you so you can figure it out. Yeah. The first thing the amygdala is going to do is give you this these feelings, which are powerful. They, they're supposed to be powerful because – the amygdala is supposed to be able to get your attention no matter what you're doing. So if you're up on a step ladder painting the ceiling and trying to be very careful over near the wall so you don't touch the roll on the wall, really concentrating. If you lost your balance, the amygdala is going to zap you. Yeah. No matter how much <laughs> you're concentrating and make you say, oh, well, forget about the ceiling, you're about to fall. It's got to have a powerful enough signal, <laughs> feelings, Whatever it is that you you get when you get a shot of stress hormones, it's got to be powerful enough to grab you, but then it's got to release you. Yeah. And it won't release you unless your parasympathetic nervous system kicks in that overrides the alarm. That makes so, so much if, sense. If the alarm doesn't shut down, the alarm is going to make you believe that you're having a heart attack mm -hmm. or make you believe that you can't escape this MRI or that you it's going to throw you into a state that you can't calm yourself down. Right. 
and you're along yeah. for the ride. Yeah. That, no, it totally makes sense. I, and I, I'm, you know, I, I hope our listeners really got that and got that there, there is a solution and it's not difficult and your book and your, uh, your, your meetup, uh, that you have on Wednesdays, um, you know, these are, these are two really, really great resources that'll help you to reprogram that so that yeah. you can, uh, you can function during any, you know, any of these uh, stressful times that we've been, we've well, been ha- all having I, to deal with. I don't know. You know, the term unconscious procedural memory. Um, people who do first responder kinds of work, when they're in life and death situations, their executive function, their high level thinking doesn't work when you're highly stressed. So what you do to be able to perform in those high stress situations is train. So do you have a procedure that you use in a certain situation and you do the procedure again, and again, and again, so that when you're in the high stress situation, your unconscious procedural memory can do that for you we all use unconscious procedural memory to drive a car. For example, when you mm-hmm. first drive a car, it's kind of difficult. You got to do it consciously. And as you said, conscious mind isn't a match for the unconscious mind. So it takes all you've got to be able to drive poorly consciously. But once you build those steps of driving into the unconscious mind, you can have the, have a conversation while you're driving along the car. So what we need to do is to build this software and the, takes alarm and down regulates it immediately so that you don't get psychic equipments down regulates it. So you don't mistake what you're imagining for what's real. And that takes care of all the anxiety and panic issues. Well, that's wonderful. Well, on that note, it's been, uh, it's been wonderful having you back on the show again. Thank you so much, Victoria. I'm really happy to be able to to help get the word out because this, this can make such a difference in people's lives. It absolutely will. I, and I believe that. And so, um, I encourage you to, uh, if you're listening here to, you know, take advantage of this free group counseling every Wednesday night, if you've been dealing with any panic and also go uh, grab yourself a copy of the latest workbook, um, say the name of the workbook um, again, panic free pandemic workshop. Yeah. Uh, workbook. Panic. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> workbook panic free yeah, pandemic the workshop, workbook. It's kind of Wednesday night. So let me, let me just, if you go to fear of flying.com, look across fear the of flying.com. And you'll see one of the headings is talk and read. And if you open that, you'll see chat. We have a typed in chat. We have the Zoom meeting there. If you're looking for those cartoons of Popeye and Superman and so on, that's fearofflying.com slash photos. Photos. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Right. Wonderful. Okay. Well, it's very helpful, very helpful, very timely. And uh, so thank you once again for thank being you. on the power of your mind podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your friends. And once again, be sure to subscribe to the power of your mind podcast. If not already, we can be found as hip talk on all our social media accounts. So like us on Facebook, Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, subscribe on YouTube, and sign up for your free self-hypnosis video training course at hiptalk.com. Be sure to subscribe to the Power of Your Mind podcast, and you'll be instantly notified the moment the next podcast becomes available. Also, please be sure to leave a rating and a review to tell us how you're enjoying these episodes, and that way you're making a contribution toward others getting to share in this valuable information. Thank you so much. And I'll talk to you soon. You've been listening to the Power of Your Mind podcast brought to you by HipTalk.com, Personal Growth Club, and HypnoCloud apps available at iTunes.